Hello, everybody. Welcome to our free session today. My name is Cindy Haight, and we are going to be talking about uh, QMS implementation frequently asked questions. Um, so just to uh, introduce ourselves real quickly, uh, my name is Cindy Haight. I work for our certification and training divisions here at SGS North America. Um, I've been with the company uh, for two years so far and have worked in the certification industry for over 20 years, although I know I don't look old enough to have that much experience. <laughs> um, I've worked with companies to, uh, as like global companies to help them arrange their certifications, uh, certification audits for multi-sites, I've worked in training, um, and now I assist customers with uh, certification to core ISO standards, including ISO 9001, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, we have our, our uh, speaker today is Ms. Sabrina Ippolito. Do you want to introduce yourself, Sabrina? Sure. My name is Sabrina. I've been working with SGS for, I think this year it's going to be in and around nine years. Uh, also, I've been working on the certification side for both accredited and non-accredited standards. I work in uh, consulting and I am also a trainer. So maybe some of you, if you've had any training with SGS, you may have had me as uh, your trainer. I'm classically trained biochemist. I graduated from university in 2007 and I'm currently doing my master's in education in uh, leadership. So it's how to uh, better inform adults and specifically working in transformative learning. That's a little bit about me. Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little <laughs> bit about SGS before we dive into our um, information today. Um, SGS is the world's global leader in the TIC industries, TIC being testing, inspection, and certification. You can see we have uh, many offices, 2,650 offices, 98,000 employees around the, the globe, and we have seven focused areas of our service. Uh, you can see that we are approaching our 150th anniversary, uh, so I'm sure we'll uh, have some celebrations coming up here in a few years. Uh, here's just a little synopsis of the services we offer through uh, the Knowledge Solutions Division, where Sabrina and I work. Um, of course, we offer certification services to various standards. Um, we'll talk about that in a little while. We offer an extensive training program through SGS Academy. We'll talk about that in a little while. Um, we do also offer customized audits, uh, second party audits, audits for your supply chain. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, you can reach out to me after the session. And we also offer uh, technical consulting services. Uh, the SGS difference, we, uh, we believe in the, these three core fundamentals of our business to achieve our excellent level of customer service and partnership with our customers, including our quality of service, our vast industry experience, as well as our global network. So we are here to support you globally, domestically, however we can. Um, so these are um, some of the topics that we're going to uh, review today. Today's session is a frequently asked question session, as I mentioned. Um, over the course of 2023, Sabrina and I had a great time um, hosting five different webinar sessions in a QMS uh, series. So um, we hosted in sequence the fundamentals of a QMS. Uh, we had a session on risk assessment. Our third session discussed internal audits and management review and how fundamental and crucial uh, those two processes are to your quality management system. Uh, we discussed uh, nonconformances and corrective actions. And also our, our last session uh, reviewed the certification journey. <clears throat> So these uh, questions today are just kind of the best questions and some great, great questions that we encountered during the last five sessions. And uh, if you have any other questions as we go through the content today, I hope that you will uh, feel free to type those in the Q&A area. 
Um, I did want to just start the day off uh, before we get in deep to the questions, uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, different ways that SGS can help your company. Um, I know that a lot of you guys are already certified uh, and some of you may be considering certification. Um, I know that this year might be a recertification for your company, which is, you know, happens every third year in your cycle. Um, if you are certified with another company, uh, I do want to mention that we have a very uh, easy process to transfer your certification to SGS. Uh, we do a, a simple review of your past audit reports, your certificate, and that enables us to issue a like for like certificate with our logo under, under SGS, and then we simply pick up your next audit in the cycle. If that's something that you would like to discuss, please feel free to reach out to me after the session. We'll put up our contact information for you. Yeah. Um, I also did want to touch briefly on, uh, I know a lot of businesses are kind of expanding their certifications and also um, exploring ESG, environmental social governance uh, type of endeavors for the company. And I just wanted to mention, um, you know, there are so many ISO standards um, in addition to ISO 9001 quality management system. And uh, when I know, I know uh, we keep talking about the transition, but it's very important uh, when ISO 9001 and ISO 14001 environmental management systems, when these standards went through the revision in 2015, uh, the intention was to uh, implement all standard revisions in accordance with the Annex SL, which is the high level structure. So if you've ever considered um, moving forward with additional certifications or if you're currently operating a separate QMS or EMS or occupational health and safety systems um, certifications, there's great opportunities to save um, on audit time and on your time by integrating those standards. Um, there are, uh, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of information that I can share to you. If, you're, if you'd like to discuss that, reach out to me. Um, but if you are interested in that, you can save up to like 20% of your audit time by implementing integrated uh, management systems. And it's something mm -hmm. uh, really good to consider because it streamlines your operations. It makes things easier on your staff because everybody's kind of uh, using these same structures to to uh, better enhance and integrate their systems. So it's really something important to think about. Um, and, you know, if, if you have any questions about that, feel free to uh, drop those in the Q&A area. And we can discuss that a little bit later in the session today. All right, so back to our frequently asked questions. Um, Sabrina, we have uh, questions about any upgrades to ISO 9001 that are coming down the road. Uh, the last upgrade was in 2015. So do you know of any uh, updates or, or revisions that are coming our way? That's an excellent question. In fact, it's one of the questions I am always asked during a certification audit, or even when I'm doing consulting and or uh, training on the standard specifically. So nothing's uh, written in stone as of yet. And if you look at the, at the past history of certifications, uh, the last one that we had was in 2015, and the one before that was in 2008. So generally it averages between five, six, seven, eight years, right? Um, generally this one being the exception and the reason for it is because it has worked so well so the accreditation bureau ANAB uh, has received feedback from uh, multiple certification bureaus SGS included and feedback from us auditors in terms of the clients and how they feel about the standard and everybody's been very pleased with it and this is why they haven't uh, imposed the new revision of the standard that being said there is some buzzing that I'm starting to hear that maybe perhaps there may be a new revision in and around 2030. Now, does that mean it's, it's a hard fact? No, it's just, it's just what we're hearing in, uh, in industry, perhaps. So just keep in mind, this is not set in stone. 
we don't know if it's going to happen let's say in 2027 and everybody has to be certified in 2030 or if it's going to happen in 2030 and everyone has to be certified by 2023 because they will still give us a three-year transition period in us in order for uh, for us to transition over like they did with the 2015. but again it's not set in stone this is just the buzzing and the rumors that we're hearing in the industry so unfortunately there's no real answer i can provide you with that fair enough um the next question i have is how often do i need to be audited in order to be compliant with iso 9001 okay so let's be careful with the words we're not talking about necessarily compliance we're talking about conforming Compliance is generally the term that we use for regulatory bodies like the FDA or Health Canada or anyone like that, any regulatory body. So generally speaking, uh, you will be audited, must be audited by your certification body once a year. And if you're with SGS, SGS uh, will audit you once a year. But if you're coming, uh, if it's a recertification year for you, what they will do is at least audit you 60 days before your date of expiration. And that you can look for the date on the certificate. So the answer is yes, you have to be audited every single year, at least once per year. There are some organizations that want to be audited twice a year. So instead of auditing whatever's been planned, uh, during uh, a V2 or a V3, what they'll do is they'll break it up in um, two parts throughout the year. But this is, again, it's a client, uh, a client's decision and they want to be, they want to make sure that they're staying on top of things. So that's the benefit of doing it twice a year. And I mean, it works with everybody because it shortens uh, also your audit, right? The only thing is it might impose uh, slightly more expenses, especially if you're getting the auditor to fly out or to, to drive out to the location. So just keep that in mind. But uh, you can opt for two audits per year where they take the audit that's scheduled for the year and they just split it, they slice it in half and they say, okay, well, we're going to audit this chunk, let's say in January and this next chunk come by June or July. And we try to keep a six month in between the audits. We try, but I mean, again, it depends on availability as well. Next. Good question, so by the way. What, what if... Um, our company is certified and we have some uh, huge change, like we hire a bunch of people or we want to launch a new process. Is there a way to make like an extension to the scope throughout the year? Do you wait until the anniversary or the next surveillance or what, what would you recommend if we have any major changes to our business? Fabulous question. Oh, this is a goodie. So um, your best bet, okay, whenever you're making these drastic changes is advise uh, your scheduler or advise your point of contact at SGS immediately. Immediately. And the reason why immediately. And the reason why I'm yeah. saying this is because if we need to plan additional days or remove additional days, you want to be able to schedule that before the audit day. Otherwise, you run the risk that, I mean, removing days is not the end of the world for, you know, especially if you've been booked for the audit. But if you have to add days and your auditor can't provide you that, then you might the auditor might have to might have to schedule a team of auditors to be able to meet those days that were allocated for that audit. Your best bet, always err on the side of caution. Don't take unnecessary risks if you don't have to. Always, always, always advise your point of contact at SGS. Always. Mm. Um, yep, we have a change of notification form. It's very simple. And, you know, mm -hmm. we can share that to you. And you can give us any updates if they, if they come up. So the, I guess the key takeaway is just keep us informed so we can continue to support your certification. Okay. Oh, here's a good question. Would you recommend that we opt for an unannounced or surprise audit, or is each audit always on the schedule? Okay. So um, whenever they are certification audits or external audits, so this is what we call a third-party audit, they are not 
uh, there are always announced audits. So you are given at the very minimum uh, two, heads no uh, two weeks head notice or a month heads notice that you will have an audit and who the auditor is. And generally speaking, most companies prefer working with the same auditor because you establish a rapport and um, it just, that's just typically what we end up seeing in industry. Um, Cindy. You're going to forgive me. I've got mommy brain with a three month old, but what was the question? <laughs> Would you recommend any um, unannounced audits? You know, should okay. we expect anything that's unannounced or a surprise visit from SGS during the course of our certificate or certification? Mm -hmm. We never, as, as a third party auditor, as a certification uh, body, we never provide unannounced audits. They are always announced as internal auditors, however, I'm a huge advocate for unannounced audits. <laughs> You're speaking to someone who's worked in the field of uh, medical field and uh, narcotics and precursors and scheduled drugs. Oh, I love unannounced audits because this is the best way to determine whether or not your system is actually working. Or are people just preparing for the audit? Uh, but rest assured as long as we're talking about iso 9001 and in the spirit of iso 9001 which is what we're here to discuss they will always be announced all right thank you for that um here's a good question how do i get my management team to buy in like you know a lot of us know the value of a uh, quality management system and what ISO can bring to the table. But of course, there's always people that might be budget conscious or resource conscious. How do I sell the idea to my management team? Well, I would reverse engineer that. So the way I would probably do it is first and foremost, you need to understand the language that your CEO, boss, president, upper management speaks or who I like to call the purse handlers of the organization. And you need to be able to speak their language. Generally speaking, they speak the language of finance, of money. And organizations, as you know, are there to make money, not to lose money. And we all know, working in quality, what kind of a hurdle that sometimes can be. Um, what I tend to do is and I've done this on, on several occasions, uh, and respectfully, it has worked very well in, in my favor, is I have shown the benefits with numbers. So for instance, um, I show trends, and I'll look at trends from a monthly basis, I'll look at trends from a quarterly basis, I'll go as far back as maybe two, three years and say, you know, like since um, we've grown the company, I understand like a smaller company, may not necessarily have the funds to uh, to make the investment to have a certification like uh, an ISO 9001. But when you're at a substantial level where you're having different uh, interested parties that are coming uh, to work for you, especially employees, everybody comes with their own uh, you know baggage of information and what they've learned and their epistemic uh, perspective and how they see the world and how they think the, the, the job should be done. And these things might not necessarily be aligned with, with the company. So having a, a very constructive conversation like that, but also showing data, showing trends, showing non-conformances. So you can equally, like between you and I, uh, you can still implement a process and it could be a process of non-conformances, a process of uh, waste, where you're calculating how much waste is being produced on a, on a weekly, on a monthly, uh, customer complaints. Uh, because we all know that uh, you want to lose business fast, just increase those customer complaints and do nothing about those customer complaints. So what I like to do is I like to hit them where it hurts and say, well, this is currently what's going on. This is how I think we could implement a quality management system. This is what is required. This is the investment needed. So do your homework, do your due diligence, and then present it like a business proposal, the way you would present a business proposal proposal to, to your boss, you would do something similar to uh, the VP or someone who's in charge of the purse string. I've used that method on several occasions and it's worked really well. Um, to tag on that, we do have a question from our audience and um, they comment that the buy-in from core team members is a challenge. Um, they have support from top management but not necessarily from like product or process owners. 
or you know core team members how do you get the team on board <laughs> uh, i'm gonna answer that question with two words learning organization you need to sell it to them and training between you and i all right it's not did you read and understand the procedure you need to constantly have conversations with them you need to go to drawing boards you need to get them involved you need to show them how it's beneficial how it's going to help the company one of the things i remember being in a in uh, having audited a company uh she told her boss let me help you look good to your boss so tool me with the necessary tools you might be spending a bit of money but tool me with the necessary tools to make your life easier and so that you shine in front of your boss try that strategy but uh, i highly implore you i highly recommend uh, you look into learning organizations because it seems to me that based on that question you might be the company might be lacking a little bit on that uh, territory very good question by the way thank you All excellent right, even um we do have another question from our audience um Ooh. our OEM or original equipment manufacturer does not want to provide their technical file, but our auditors are asking for it. How do I get our suppliers to be more conformant with my needs and, and my requests? Why wouldn't they provide you with that? I think this is a, this is a, a lengthier conversation. Why wouldn't they provide you with that? I know every equipment that I've purchased always has come with a user's manual, has come. Now, granted, if we're talking about validation documentation, it's a different story because not everybody will provide you with that validation uh, certificate or uh, I'm going to use an acronym uh, IQ, OQ, PQ, which is installation qualification, operational qualification, performance qualification. That's an extra that you'll have to pay for. That falls under validation especially if you are in the OTC drug manufacturing, you would need that. Um, but for additional information, like the equipment itself, they should be providing you with that. The, uh, the user manual, that should probably come with your equipment. I, if possible, would you like to maybe reach out to myself and or Cindy at the end of the um, training? I can... Maybe with a bit more of a discussion, if I have a bit more meat around that question, I can help direct you a little bit better. That's an interesting yeah, I one. Think, yeah, maybe what we'll do is we'll reach out to you after the session. We'll send you an email and kind of yeah. connect. I'll, I'll connect with you uh, independently. And we'll see if we can get you some more information to help with that question. Yeah, but that's a very good question too. Thank you for bringing it up. That's an interesting one. It's the first time I come across it. That is a good question. Um, here's another question. What ISO standard would you recommend for CGMP company who manu manufactures over-the-counter ingredients? Would that be like an ISO 9001 or okay. a pharmaceutical? Excellent question. Um, if you are a startup and you don't yet have your license uh, with uh, Health Canada or DF let's do Health Canada because I'm in Canada, but I mean, if you're in the US, it would be FDA, okay? Um, I always start with, so I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, let's not look at Mount Everest, let's look at the first steps that we need to, to take. So the best one to start with, and I've done this, especially within the cannabis industry, is always start with implementing your ISO 9001. Because a lot of the main components in ISO 9001 are transferable to uh, CGMP, which is uh, current good manufacturing practices. For any francophones on the call, ce sont des BPF, des bonnes pratiques de fabrication. Um, so I would always start with an ISO 9001 build that, work off of that, once that's been implemented and you've done maybe a good year with it, then add on your CGMP. If you were doing cosmetics, and by cosmetics, I don't mean, for instance, head and shoulders. And the reason I say that is because albeit that head and shoulders, as an example, is a shampoo, because it has a DIN number, a drug identifying number, it's not considered a cosmetic. But if you are in the cosmetic industry, there is a standard you can use. It is ISO 22716. I hope that answers your question. 
Awesome. Oh, hang on. A little note Benny in there. If you're wanting to implement CGMPs in Canada, it's part C division two or GUI. So that's G U I zero 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 one. Those are your CGMPs, your current good manufacturing practices, the bon pratique de fabrication. Otherwise, if you're in the US, it is 21 CFR parts 210 to 11. And if there's anyone in Europe, it's uh, EU GMP parts one and two. And they're harmonized, they speak the same language. Pretty much at 99.8% of you all. Awesome, thank you, Sabrina. I love Absolutely. hearing you speak French, by the way. <laughs> oh, un peu romantique. <laughs> Oh, so one of our sessions from last year um, covered yeah. root cause analysis and corrective actions. Um, in your experience, what is the most effective root cause analysis tool? Okay. Great question. Um, there's two ways I can answer this. The easiest one of the ones to use is the five whys. So it's think of your toddler, if you have a toddler, uh, or if you've ever had a toddler, I'm sure that they've had the phase. I know my, my three and a half year old is currently in that phase. Mama, perché? Mommy, why? Mommy, why? Mommy, why? And mommy, why? And why, 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 why? Why? So you ask the question why five times. That's why it's called the five whys. But you have to answer the question each time. And that should hopefully help navigate you to what the root cause might be. Uh, the other ones I like very, very much, which um, in the spirit of ISO 9001, being that we talk about the leadership team and we talk about uh, um, you know, groups and we talk about you know, quality is not just a responsibility of one person, but it's the responsibility of all people, all people involved, everybody working within the organization. Um, I like using the fishbone diagram because it gets everybody involved. And when people are involved, it doesn't sound so much as I've got the power and I'm telling you what to do, but you're getting people involved to brainstorm. And also this is a benefit because it allows you to see uh, a different perspective from the perspective of the person who's doing the day to day on a daily. Uh, so I also like the fishbone diagram. Um, Depending on your industry, depending on your organization, depending on what you're using, uh, what you're trying to investigate. Another popular one is FMEA, which is a failure modes analysis. I've seen other people use the Pareto chart. Again, it depends on your industry, depends what you feel comfortable with. I know uh, many engineers, if you're a company that has a significant amount of engineers, they are very strong with the FMEA. Uh, if you're an organization that's making like little rivets, nuts and bolts, I would maybe think twice about the FMEA uh, and maybe consider the five whys analysis. So it is industry dependent and it is also, uh, you wanna know what is it that you're using it for. Another important point, um, if you are writing your procedures on how to do root cause analysis, because as you know, there is a, a requirement in the standard uh, that does speak about corrective actions. Think about not limiting yourselves to just one, one way of investigating. Remember, we're all humans, but we all have a different perspective. We all come from a different background. We all have different experiences having worked in organizations. And maybe we've all been coached and mentored from different people who have shown us their perspective, a perspective that has now been ingrained in the way that we see the world. So what I highly recommend that you do is if you have a procedure on corrective um, um, corrective analysis or corrective reports, me for that. it's okay, corrective actions as an example, I highly recommend that you mention that or, you know employees are welcome to use a variety of uh, investiga investigative tools such as the five whys, Pareto chart, a fishbone diagram also uh, coined as the Ishikawa diagram, FMEA, whatever they feel comfortable using as a means to be able to get the job done. And again, the purpose of, and I can't stress this enough, the purpose of an ISO 9001, when we're there to audit you, when an auditor is there to audit you, we're there in support of your activities, but make sure that the process that you're putting in place is what you're doing because we're holding you accountable for what you are documenting to say 
are you following what you said you would do? So this is why I often tell people, don't just limit yourself to one thing or limit yourself to one uh, way of solving or investigating. But be open to uh, to different different types because people see the world from a different perspective, almost like a kaleidoscope. I'm done. <laughs> That's my note, Bene. <laughs> I know we could talk about this for a long time, Sabrina. <laughs> yes, we can. Um, just to touch base or kind of piggyback on this um, topic, and this is regarding customer satisfaction. Sure. Um, we have uh, like a customer satisfaction survey to try to evaluate, get the feedback and everything. Um, this this question, uh, this, this person doesn't feel it's highly effective. Um, mm. Do you have any input for uh, good methods to, to get solid feedback from your customers? Okay, so the important thing when you're doing uh, is it it's customer satisfaction or is it is it customer complaints? Uh, customer satisfaction survey specifically. Hmm. Okay. So chances are you have the information of the client who sent you back that survey. Have you I perhaps? To... Go ahead. I think it's to get them to take the survey and to engage with the survey. Like, how do you deliver the uh, survey to the client to get them to really want to engage and give you solid feedback? Is there any tricks okay. that you can uh, recommend or verbiage you can recommend? Okay, so I've seen people do a, a slew of things and, and it's always one that I puzzle and I scratch my head with. I've seen people give uh, incentives, like fill out the survey and you'll be in to draw a $100 gift card for pizza pizza. The standard, I want you to think about what the standard is requiring you or what it, what it requires you to meet that, that requirement, okay? The standard explicitly says customer satisfaction. How you do that, is up to you. Yes, you could use a, a survey. The problem with using a survey is this. You'll get someone who's very high strung with numbers, like me, who comes to audit someone like you, your organization. I'm gonna ask you keywords for customer satisfaction. How many surveys did you send out? We sent out 100. This is just so I can compute quicker in my math, uh, my math in my mind. We sent out 100. How many did you receive back? We got back 13. So in my mind, I'm thinking that's 13%. 13% is not indicative in terms of the masses, in terms of companies think like this about you. So now I'm gonna question this. I'm like, well, how do you know you're actually doing a good job if, if you're only getting 13% of the feedback? So. The standard says customer uh, satisfaction. Do you receive love letters from your clients saying, thank you so much for getting me out of this bind? Do you have outside salespeople that speak with your clients where they have conversations every so often, whatever that frequency might look like? And they say, my goodness, you know, you guys really, you really saved our skin. Uh, you were there for us uh, in a bind. Do you have that? If you have this, consider keeping it. What I tell everybody is everyone has access to email, or at least most people have access to email. Make yourself um, an inbox called customer satisfaction. I like playing around with things. I call it love letters. I mean, it's called it's caused a little bit of friction in my marriage, I'll be honest with you. My husband was like, hmm. But needless to say, once he saw what was in there, he's like, okay, I get it. He's like, but why call it love letters? Because the thing is, that's what they are. They, they're, they're, they make you feel good. And a love letter will do exactly that. It'll make you feel good. And then your job, depending on where you are uh, situated within the organization, uh, and I really hate using the word hierarchy. I don't, that's not a word that's in my vocabulary. Um, but it becomes essential for you to post these love letters, these hey, thank you so much for helping me out on this order. I really needed you to come in for me. 
it makes that person on your production line or in production or in services, all depending on what your organization is, it makes them not only feel good, but it gives them meaning to what they're actually doing on a daily because they don't hear this. So giving them back this feedback and posting it in a communal area like um, a lunch area or uh, in a, on a bulletin board as they're walking into production or within the production billboard, or even if you have monitors that you are uh, screens that you're using within the within production to show like these are our rates for for waste, not conformances, stop lines, the start times, and so on and so forth. It's a great way to share all of these uh, all of this customer feedback. Now, if some of you don't want to let go of those surveys. That's fine. You can also uh, show and indicate customer satisfaction as a combination. Surveys, a phone call that you might get, which you drop down or you send yourself an email so that you can put it back in there. Make sure that you uh, write down what the conversation was about, uh, the, um, who you spoke with, uh, um, the client, uh, the client not a name so that you have something to go off of. Uh, these become very essential, in my opinion. So you can have a procedure, a lot like root cause analysis, where I told you not to limit yourself to just one way of investigation, but collect your customer satisfaction from different avenues, from different ways. So I would challenge you to do that. It works really well, honestly. It really does. The more input, the better, right? Oh, absolutely. Data-driven input is good. Auditors like that. Um, we have a and really good... This way, it's not... Sorry, think of it this way. It's not quantitative where we're saying, oh, you only received 13 out of 100. That's 13%, but it's qualitative. It's not measurable. Yeah. Both so. are important. Yeah. So we have a really good comment slash question. Um, and this is awesome. I know generally auditors do not love seeing human error as the root cause of an observation, but what happens if it was a human error, like for real human error, like what do you Excellent. document and correct? Like, how do you handle that? Very good question. Very good I'm question. one of those auditors, by the way. <laughs> I hate seeing human error because it is the easiest thing. So the way I see it is I, I worked in quality for a while, right? And it's just easy to write human error. I, I retrained the person, signed off, signed off, whatever, and the, the, the thing is put aside. The thing is, when you are going to state that it's human error, we want to make sure that you have done the investigation that led you to attest and conclude that it is, in fact, human error. That's what we want to see. If we don't see that, depending on what we're reading on your documentation, on your report, we can tell you that that's not adequately done. And if we see that often enough, you can actually get a finding for that. So you gotta be very careful. So what I, I highly implore what I highly implore you to do, five whys, Ishikawa diagram. In the Ishikawa diagram, there is a section for, for humans, employees, okay? So if you think it's an employee, then at least show that the homework was done. If you, if you think it is human error, at least show that the homework was done, that the investigation was done, and that we think it may have been human error. So this is what we're doing to correct the issue. This is our corrective action. Then you should have a follow-up. If you see on your follow-up that after having done the retraining because you did attribute it to human error, and everything is good and you haven't had any non-conformances, any customer complaints or anything impacting um, the product and or the client negatively because of that retraining that was due to human error, then we can say you did your homework properly. But if you just say it's human error and I'm going to address it with training, mm -mm. this goes back to for any of you that were there for the one of the trainings that I had given. Do you remember the training that I mentioned about Bob when he asked, when he fell down, he slipped on some oil and he hurt his knee and the quality individual that I was auditing said, well, I showed Bob how to walk through the warehouse because it's human error. He should have avoided that oil spill. I'm like, well, no, there should have never been an oil spill to begin with, especially if it's a brand spiking new uh, machine. Right. So it's a little bit on, on that one, on that uh, typical level wavelength if you will. 
Um, so we had a really good uh, comment and um, about the five Y method, and um, <clears throat> this person really appreciates and utilizes the five Y. But did want to comment yep. that sometimes we need to go more deeply to get to the true root cause. It's not always just the first thing that you see it may not be the final root cause. So, you, you know, you might want to keep digging deeper um, with your questions until you really get where you need to be. So right. I that was but really also, good absolutely. But also nothing stops you from using, from starting off with the five whys and then transitioning into the fishbone diagram. Right. So you can also use multiple methods at the same time. Again, it's, it depends. It depends on the industry. I'm going to go back and I digress. It depends on the industry. It depends on the complexity of the situation, of the investigation. It, it really depends on the organization. And it depends on the situation that you're trying to, that you're trying to investigate. But absolutely, 100% agreed. 100%. All right. Well, maybe we should move on and talk about internal audits a little bit. Um, this was a big session for us. Um, yeah. Internal audits are super important, as we all know. Um, it's important to, to really have a team uh, approach to this um, process. And uh, there's ways to utilize it to get the ultimate value to really understand your systems, understand your processes and, and make improvements. Um, so here's a good question. How often should we conduct internal audits? This is a loaded question with many layers. Um, in my, in my opinion, audits should always be ongoing, but this also depends on your resources that you have. Um, Again, let's let's base ourselves on on an industry. So, if you are in, uh, I don't know, let's say you are in CNC, so you're dealing with metals bending, pressing, uh, turning the the whole the whole the whole gambit, the whole nine yards. Um, all depending on the different technologies that you have, you might have in and around 50, 60, 80, maybe even 100 procedures. Uh, many of these might be procedure procedures because they're, uh, they're high level structures. In some cases, what I have also seen are work instructions. So these procedures are not really procedures, but they're more work instructions. They'll tell you how to go about how to do something like it answers the how aspect, like press this button, that button, and the follow sequence with X and Y buttons as well. So if this is something, if you're wanting to have just a one level structure, you can say, okay, well, we have, we're an organization of 100 uh, that, that has 100 procedures as an example. So what you can do is you can have a team, generally speaking, if you're doing, if you're conducting the internal audits yourselves, internal to the organization, you should be at least two auditors. Because as you know, you cannot audit your own work. So you need someone else in a different department to audit your own work. Um, what I like to do is I break up my 100 procedures between two people over the span of a year. If I know I don't want to do any audits in the month of December, I'm going to take that number, divide it by 11. Or if I know that over the summer, I don't want to do it because there's people that take vacations divided by 10. So 100 procedures divided by 10 is 10 procedures. So you can actually audit five procedures, each auditor, if you're a uh, a team of two auditors every month. Some organizations are like, yeah, but I don't have time for that because I'm busy also working on my own things on my on my job. I don't have time to allocate to this. Well, OK, how about having a schedule over two years? You can do a schedule over three years. Generally speaking, we try not to do more than two or try not to go over the three years. Just keep in mind that everything that touches quality, uh, customer complaints, corrective actions, not conformances, risk, uh, context of the organization. Basically, everything that your auditor typically audits every single time he comes to audit you should, at the very minimum, be audited every single year. So nothing stops you from auditing your system over a span of two years. Just remember that if you are going to do a partial audit every year, you still need to provide an audit report for that year. And obviously before your auditor comes to audit you, just keep that in mind. Also, another important note, um, 
make sure that your auditors, if you have a team of auditors, uh, make sure that your auditors are auditing at the very minimum once per calendar year. That also becomes equally important. Otherwise, as an auditor, we can uh, challenge their competency. I mean, it's we can have that conversation. You can be like, Sabrina, this is an employee that's been auditing for the last 30 years. I think we, if she doesn't, if he or she doesn't audit in one year, I think they're okay, which I'm like, okay, that's fine. I, I, I can understand that because they have just a substantial amount of, of knowledge of auditing previously. But generally speaking, what we look for is that auditors are auditing at the very minimum once a year. Um, and nothing also so stops you from auditing, let's say a week or a month a year. You can do that as well, but know that you can also break that up over months within a year. Sorry, uh, Cindy, sorry for cutting you off. No, that's fine. Um, so uh, here's a good question. Um, do we have to audit our internal auditing process? Yes. To me, how do we validate that that's an effective internal auditing process? First and foremost, you want to make sure that the person who's audited a process is not a person in which that the department they belong to. So for instance, if you have someone in sales who's auditing the sales process, that's a non-conformance right there. Uh, your internal audit process is a process. It's like all other processes that you have. Customer complaints, non-conformances, corrective actions, sales, production, scheduling, inventory control, so on and so forth. So absolutely, internal audits also must be audited. And also internal audits, as you know, is one of the processes that your external auditor audits every single year. And therefore that too needs to be audited internally every single year. If you are a very small organization, two, three people, and you're like, well, we're all kind of doing the same thing. There is a way of doing it internally where, you know, myself, I would be auditing, let's say Cindy and Cindy would be auditing, auditing my work. We could do that. We can work in tandem. Another thing that you are allowed to do is get an external source to come in and audit you. you. Give them a mandate for one day and you say, okay, I want you to audit my QMS. Your job, if that's the way that you want to go, one, make sure that you reflect that in your procedure but two, make sure that you have an onboarding process for your service providers. For instance, what qualifies this person that you use? Uh, so you definitely want their CV and at the bare minimum, you want um, their certificate of internal auditor that they've actually followed uh, a course and can in fact be an internal auditor. So that, that is the equivalent of ISO 19011. Um, so just to kind of go back a little bit in our slides, um, I did skip over the training slide. I was going to talk about it a little bit towards the end of the session. Um, uh, geez, sorry about that. Um, no so training for um, your company and your team is uh, it's a part of the requirements. You have to show competency as, as uh, Sabrina was saying, and as the question indicates, um, so we offer a modular course of study, as you can see, um, and this is a, it's a four day course of study and you can attend two days to learn the requirements of the standard in detail. You can attend three days on day three. Um, we're going to be talking about internal auditor, how to, you know, auditing skills um, and different um, different activities to kind of play out and audit and and just to learn how to be an effective auditor so if you attend those three days that is your um, proof of competency training That's we right. also you can tag on day four and uh, become a lead <clears throat> a lead auditor which is where like if you have a large internal auditing team at your company um, and you need to you know delegate or allocate the plan um, and things like that you can stay on day four to learn how to do that um, just as an aside we do offer the highest level of um, ISO 9001 lead auditor training also for the other standards. Um, but this is a five day intensive course. There's an expectation that you have extensive knowledge of the standard and also auditing experience. Um, so the intention of this five day IRCA course is to qualify you as 
a lead auditor, like a third party lead auditor. Um, just so you're aware of what those differences are in the courses, again, these are across the board for ISO 9001, 14001, and down the road. Uh, you can grab that QR code um, to take you right to the website. Of course, we'll be sharing these slides to you um, and each of these uh, courses uh, where it says US and CA are linked to the website. So you can uh, click right through if you're interested in learning more information about that. Just wanted to, to review that awesome. real quickly. Sabrina is one of our uh, esteemed trainers. Um, do you have any other comments about our training program right now? Um. Less is more. If you're thinking about training, one of the things I really, I mean, if you do remote training, that, that works really well, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, but less is more. So when you're thinking about uh, maximizing the amount of information you'll get out of those trainings, when you have groups of five and under, they work amazing. Anything more than five, I feel that you end up losing the allure. And the reason for it is because they're usually done during business hours. And because they're done during business hours, everybody knows how busy everybody is. So I have to excuse myself from training. I have to do this. I have to do that. And you tend to give yourself more of an excuse, if you will, whenever you're a large number of people thinking that will find the trainers not necessarily going to see me or whatnot. But the thing is, you want to keep those classes, you want to keep those courses uh, at a minimum. And they work super, 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 super well. We do give private training as well. If you like my style and my uh, rapport when it comes to just the standard alone, you can also request for me, and I'm sure we can make something work. One of the things I think, uh, Cindy, uh, and excuse me if I'm wrong, and if you've heard uh, else, uh, differently in within SGS, then please do correct me. Um, but I, I was I had spoken with the training manager and, uh, you know, something that we are maybe looking at uh, into elaborating and, and doing is if training works better for you, let's say off hours when uh, you're not working and we can break this up over a period of X amount of sessions. We can also do this after hours and in some cases even during the weekend. So this is something that we're maybe dabbling in a little bit. I know I would totally be up for that because. It's a great tag team when you have a newborn. My husband can take uh, <laughs> he can take babysitting duties while uh, mommy works. But uh, this is also something that we are thinking about doing. And if it is something that you're interested in, uh, do keep me in mind, keep Cindy in mind, and just ask if uh, Sabrina is willing to help you out with that. And chances are, I probably will say yes, and uh, we'll definitely make something work out. Yep, we do offer that private training um, as an option. So, you know, I'm not sure Sabrina wants to come on site to your facility. I know that, uh, Sabrina, you conduct your trainings online. We do have options for on site training yeah. if you wanted to have that dedicated focus. Um, but we're very flexible um, as far as how things are arranged and are more than happy to work with you on that. Absolutely. Yeah. We are problem um, solvers, we're solution oriented. That's the, one of the best things about SGS. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, before I go back, we had a, a, um, a good question <clears throat> that I thought maybe we could just review. And this is going back to the risk assessment and the, the corrective actions and, and everything. Um, so you don't want to have your corrective actions open forever, right? But how do you close a corrective action when it's uh, you know about a, you have to do it on the next production run, and maybe you only have two production runs on that on that product per year, or um, you know something like that. Like we don't want to have the kappa open, but we don't ma maybe necessarily have an immediate opportunity to follow up on that. Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, why don't you want to keep a kappa open? I'm going to start off with that question. Um, a kappa is very different than an NCR. An NCR are fast, okay? An NCR typically within industry, again, I'm choosing my words carefully, typically, not always, typically. They're closed within a 30 to 45 day time frame. I've known some other industries that have taken up to 90 days just because of the length of investigations that are required, which are not, which are extraordinarily complex. But generally speaking, the majority of organizations will close off their NCRs within 30 days. 
The benefit of having a CAPA, because of the investigation that's required in order for you to determine what is the root cause, and through the, the Ming diagram, the Plan Do Check Act, when you find out that uh, the corrective action you put in place and you do your follow-up eventually did not yield the solution you were looking for, you have to go back to the drawing board and you have to rethink about it, maybe bring in a different set of people, a different set of eyes, tackle the situation from a different perspective. That being said, corrective actions could stay open for more than 30 days. There are specific instances where you open up an NCR and specific instances where you open up a corrective action. So just so you understand, a corrective action can stay open for a year. I've seen corrective actions stay open for a span of three years because they will open up a corrective action to address their documentation issue, which they address during the internal audit. And if you remember correctly, when you're scheduling in your internal audit, you can do partial audits on a basis or on a schedule of three years. So you can actually leave, you can actually have a corrective action that is open for more than a year. So if you're only going to be able to close that corrective action on the next production run, then what we want to see is, did you forget about that report? So how do you answer that question? Well, this was a production run and this is a next scheduled production run. And you make sure that you put that in the follow-up section and then you make your documentation based on the production run. This is, we found that uh, uh, it meets the requirements. We efficiently and effectively uh, dealt with the situation and there's no more non-conformances and it's done. The other way, if you wanna close off the, non uh, the corrective action, I generally do that during uh, an internal audit. So sometimes I will wait three months or depending when I'm auditing it, or I will wait on the next time I have to audit. It could even be a year and a half later or two years. In some cases, uh, other organizations, what they'll do is that they will question the process owner 45 days later after the uh, corrective action has been completed or implemented and say, okay, take me through the process. But the thing is, that's theoretical. When you're working and you're, especially if you're in production, it's more application based. So what I would want to see is the production run and see if I'm meeting, if I've adequately addressed the non-conformance and I've adequately investigated it to get to the root cause. So what becomes more important to me is that aspect. So Not leave it open for you. Not to go totally old school, but um, you uh, do what you say you're going to do. Basically. Yeah, do what you say you're going to do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one other comment question is we struggle with showing the contingency plan. We have risk assessments, we do our analyses, but we are having problems coming up with that contingency plan. Can you give any examples that might be helpful, Sabrina? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, um, you have determined, you determined that there's a risk on X. You will have a meeting based on X. My question to you is what are the tools that you are using to be able to rectify the situation. Um, generally speaking, what I like to do is I start off my corrective action or my non-conformance, but let's, let's say we're corrective action because you did mention risk and risk I generally uh, treat it through uh, the corrective action report through a car. Um, what I do is I document the issue. I document the immediate action. I then do a risk priority number. I then do the corrective action. I get people involved and say, okay, so what do we do? What are the steps? What, what's the action plan? People that are involved uh, will be assigned certain duties. I follow up on those duties. Once that action has been implemented and it's complete, when I'm doing my follow-up or my closure of that corrective action, which is related to the risk, I then reevaluate the risk and see if I've mitigated it. That works. And it works well and does not require rocket science. But if this seems to be too simplified for what you do, please reach out to Cindy and or myself, and we can have a little bit more of a discussion on it, and I can share with you additional methods and things that I would do. Perfect. Um, guys, we are just about out of time already. This hour flew by. Um, I know. Thank you guys for your, for your questions and for your engagement. Um, 
Here's um, a link to our fabulous YouTube channel. Um, please scan that QR code either now or when we send you the slides. Um, we have so much information posted there. There's webinars, there's uh, live event uh, speaking engagements, like anything that you can imagine. It's very helpful. You can uh, go through and see what's of interest to you and it's a really good learning tool. So I recommend that you connect with our YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, here is our contact information. Uh, reach out to me, Cindy, or to Sabrina anytime uh, if there's something we can do to help. Um, I'm always here to assist with your training and certification needs. Sabrina's the smart technical one who can really help <laughs> you with those details. Um, there is a survey in the platform. Please take our survey and provide us with your feedback. Um, I can't incentivize you other than to say it would make us very happy because it's very valuable and helps us to improve our sessions and bring you the information that you're looking for. So thank Louisa, you guys. Love letters. <laughs> yeah, we want love letters, please. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. Um, Watch our schedule. We will send you more information when new sessions are um, on, on the horizon and in our planning. Okay. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks, Sabrina. Take care. Nice seeing you. Bye, Cindy.